the traditional, and I'm putting that in air quotes, traditional therapists focus on your emotions and your feelings. A, neuropsych, a neuropsychotherapist is going to focus on your brain and behavior. Your, I'm sorry, your, yeah, your brain and behavior connection. The brain's going faster than I can talk right now. And then they kind of factor in the emotions and the feelings. So when I first meet a client, I'm listening to their linguistics because that helps me identify where certain parts of their brain are impoverished so that we can feed them and rebalance their neurology for them to have a little bit healthier psychology. I mean, the human body works together. You know, when your bicep goes, it's only a matter of time before the shoulder goes and the chest goes, right? And it's the same with our psychology. Thinking changes your neurology. Here's the million dollar question. How do men like us reach our full potential and grow into the men we dream of being while taking care of our responsibilities working, being good husbands, fathers, and still take care of ourselves? That's the question. This podcast will help you with those answers. My name is Brent, and welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast. Welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for all things man, husband, and father. Big shout out to Fallible Nation. You guys make these shows possible, and a warm welcome to our first-time listeners. My name is Brent, and today my special guest is Executive Performance Coach Elizabeth Lewis. Elizabeth, welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I've got to admit, I was reading through all it was like, wow, you just are willing to talk about so much. So I'm excited about the show. Liz, I don't do really big intros because that just doesn't, exp I get to look you up before the show, but that doesn't explain it to my guests. So in your own words, who is Elizabeth Lewis? I'm going to steal your words because they were so brilliant. I'm a work in progress. That is who I am. I'm a work in progress who's an absolute nerd who wants to be my best self and encourage people to love unconditionally and make the impossible possible. Wow. See, that was so simple and straight to the point. I have some people I ask that question, they're like, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't really know how to answer that. That's a hard question. Like, it is. Who it are is. You? I mean, it's because it's, and you know, one thing I've learned over my small life existence right now is that humans like to simplify things when most things are complicated. Yeah, I like to simplify things. I'll definitely admit that. We like overly simplify things though. I think sometimes we forget to hold the complexity. I actually never felt bad about asking people this, that question until I got asked that as a podcast guest once. And then I was like, Ugh. I have a whole new respect now for my guests. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You have to, I mean, there is something about doing shows live and doing and being on both sides because you have to be fast at thinking. Like sometimes I'm like, wait, could I go back in time and answer that question now that I have the perfect thing to say? <laughs> like, and when I was, my background's in television producing and they would always say in screenwriting class, like that's when you have a great script is when you're driving down the car going, Oh, why didn't I say that? That's what you put in the script. <laughs> Liz, what is an executive performance coach? That is a great question. Ultimately, what I do is I work with C-suite and entrepreneurs and small business owners to help them optimize their mindset, optimize their company, optimize their culture, and achieve their goals quickly and efficiently. So, you know, in, in I feel like, what, 25 years ago, mentors were a little bit more accessible in companies. And so you had that leadership skills, you had that person to always hone and develop you. And now we've made it more of an external thing of where you bring that person in. And so that's what I do is I work with people to help them really build that the right psychology because much of life comes down to psychology. You know, I think we have these business terms and we think that they're a little bit more tangible when in reality, it's more of a way of thinking. Okay. Now, let me stop here and you have two advanced degrees. Is that correct? Is that what I read? Almost. I'm finishing my second one. Yeah? yeah. What, what are those degrees? So I have a completed one in positive psychology with a subspecialty in coaching psychology. I'm finishing up my second degree in clinical mental health counseling with a subspecialty in neuropsychology. And that just allows me to be a therapist because it is a privileged word. Mm -hmm. And I technically do have a partial in industrial and organizational psychology for a doctorate, but I just got nothing. Wow. <laughs> Okay, so you really are a book nerd. No, I'm just yeah, but you know what's sad is <laughs> I learn more, like my, I say this lightly, but college is a bunch of crap at some point. 
I am disgusted at how little you learn to become a therapist because it's a, you know, it's a, it's like the standard program. It really doesn't matter where you go school wise because you have to do it if you're going to whatever. And it's so sad how little they actually learn. Like I'm learning if you really want to be amazing at something, you have to go and do the real research and read the real books on your own. Like school just teaches you the framework. If you're really passionate about something, you go out and you do it yourself. So it was funny because by the time I got to my second grad degree, I was like, I've read like half these books. <laughs> I was going through a book list just the other day, right? It was, you know, those social media things you see, right? 10 books you have to read, blah, 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 if you want to be successful at this. And there's yeah. some good information on some of those infographics. But I was mm -hmm. flipping through them. It's like, read it, read it, read it, reading it, read it. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in Barnes and Nobles with my kids. I'm like looking at number one bestsellers in business. I'm like, read it, read it. If you're willing to put it in, there's just so much to take in and learn, right? It's I'm always amazed at how much there is at our fingertips anymore. I know. Well, that's actually has changed the way business runs nowadays too, you know? Mm -hmm. I just wish that I could read as fast as I could buy a book. <laughs> that would be good. That would be really useful. <laughs> <laughs> right and not just speed read i mean like read like yeah, read absorb and remember every exactly absorb good work <laughs> liz you grew up in a really rough situation mm -hmm. uh, in your own words surrounded by fear abuse and violence how do you go from that origin to mm -hmm. helping people shape their best lives so it was a fluke, to be honest. My brother has psychopathic tendencies and he tried killing me my whole life as a, like, you know, as a kid. When I was living at home, I moved out when I was 16. And I remember going to therapy and being like, I just want transformation. I just want to stop dealing with a complex PTSD, which is what I was diagnosed with at 26. Um, and I just wanted freedom and no therapist could give me that, which I mean, they can't give it to you and I understand that, but like no one could show me the steps. So that's why I got my first degree in positive psychology. Cause I was like, well, heck, I'll just figure this out myself since nobody can tell me. And I started to become a little obsessed with neuroscience at the same time too. And so I was studying neuroscience and psychology and I was just using me as a guinea pig. And lo and, lo and behold, I ended up walking out of the trauma, walking out of some of the symptoms. I mean, at the time I had an autoimmune disease. I was having some weird brain conditions. I had all these like horrible conditions. I had no immune system. And so I didn't just change my psychology. I ended up completely changing my health too, which, you know, they are related. People forget about that. And so then when I realized like, oh, I'm good at this because my professors gave me some of their overflow, their overflow clients, and I ended up just being like good at it. And then like the rest was history. <laughs> so you went to fix yourself. Yeah. And so, so you got into it to, you know, in essence, save yourself. Oh yes. And went, you know what? I can help other people too. And I have a knack for this and here yeah. you are. Right. And you said you had a television industry background, television production. Yeah, so that, I, I that's a big a job. Model when I was fifteen, and I went behind the camera around twenty, and I was my 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 undergraduate degrees in television producing, and I was like, I don't want to do this. I mean, I really wanted to get freedom, though. I was like, I feel like I'm mentally tortured right now, and I just didn't like it. Okay. You know, it's finding the right thing. People don't understand sometimes finding the right thing isn't necessarily the most financially beneficial thing. Or it might be, but finding the right thing is highly more important sometimes than chasing a certain income goal or a certain yeah. profession. Just finding what you're meant to do, where you're meant to go, who you're meant to be. Yeah. Has so much power to it. Yeah. And that's really the path I took. I mean, I remember like walking across the stage to get my diploma when I was, I graduated late for undergrad. I think I was like 24 or something. And I was like, I don't want to do this. And then I was just like, well, I don't know what I want to do. Like I felt lost and I mean, I was struggling. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to work on fixing myself. It's almost like the Jim Rohn quote, which I cannot tell you verbatim, but it's something like if you work on yourself, money will come. Or I think Warren Buffett has said something similar. And that's kind of the path I took, which was, I don't really want to figure out my career. I want to figure out how to be healthy. 
and how to normalize some of the weird experiences and traumas I had to endure to get to where I am now. But that's the thing, like your curses can become your biggest blessings if you stick with a certain mindset or a certain viewpoint that shifts everything at the end of the day. I had to have to ask, because you had it in your bio, a question yeah. you answer. What is a neuropsychotherapist? Did I say that right? Yeah, neuropsychotherapist. So the traditional, and I'm putting that in air quotes, traditional therapists focus on your emotions and your feelings. A, neuropsych a neuropsychotherapist is going to focus on your brain and behavior. Your, I'm sorry, your, yeah, your brain and behavior connection. The brain's going faster than I can talk right now. And then they kind of factor in the emotions and the feelings. So when I first meet a client, I'm listening to their linguistics because that helps me identify where certain parts of their brain are impoverished so that we can feed them and rebalance their neurology for them to have a little bit healthier psychology. I mean, the human body works together. You know, when your bicep goes, it's only a matter of time before the shoulder goes and the chest goes, right? And it's the same with our psychology. Thinking changes your neurology. And so I'm listening for those areas that are over underdeveloped in the brain, and then we're shifting. Now, some neuropsychotherapists use like MRIs and more of the heavy technical gear to look at some of the developments of the brain. Okay, so what we're saying is I should be anxious as we talk. No, just kidding. No, you shouldn't be anxious. <laughs> I have a friend who is a content analyst for military intelligence. It's like he just had people write down their statements and then go in and question them based on what they said in their written statements and stuff. And we were at dinner one night and I signed my credit card receipt. He was like, you and your dad get in a fight today? It's like, stop analyzing me. <laughs> he just, it was That's always awesome. there with him. That's awesome. But I always just tease him about it. Your handwriting too then. Yeah. He does handwriting and content analysis. Wow. Like, yeah. Talking to him was always interesting. I was like, yeah. I'm going to come away and I'm wondering, it's like, does she think I'm a psycho now? <laughs> no, I don't. Kind of going back to my statement of like complicated, like humans are complicated. You know, we're not really good or bad. Like I can't stand <laughs> when my clients come in and they're like, I'm a good person. Like, no, you're not. No, you're, not. Stop. you're not. You have effed up thoughts. We all do. Like, it's not about being a good or bad person. At the end of the day, it's acknowledging the complicated aspects of us and working out that selfishness and that self-righteousness that really destroys us. Liz, if you could have lunch with anyone in history and talk to them, who would that be? Why? Jesus. Jesus? Jesus. Why? I mean, my faith's really important to me and I don't really, this might sound rude, but I don't really care about other people's belief systems in that aspect to me. Like... I, I, just to know what Jesus knew and to go through the frustrations of life. Like, gosh, like I just would want to learn how to hold more onto your faith and really what's important and to stay. Like, I don't know if you've ever been confrontational and you got nervous. Like, God, I would just love to learn how to be like slightly confrontational and not be nervous and still do it in a loving way. Now I'm curious though, who would you have lunch with or dinner with? Oh man, that's a really, really difficult question. Because the faith side of me definitely says Jesus, right? Yeah. Although okay. I'm more inclined to go with Peter than Jesus even. Okay. Oh, I want to know why. Because Peter gives me hope. If someone can screw up as bad as Peter <laughs> and still be let right, that gives me hope, right? I mean, but wait, Moses killed a person and God calls him the most humble person to exist. Well, and David had an affair and murdered a man over it. And yes, right. calls him a man after his own heart. But Peter walked alongside Jesus. Yeah, that's true. Daily life and screwed up over and over. And he was rash and he just went off the handle, you know, he cut off the servant's ear. He stepped out of the boat and started, right? Peter yeah. was the one who was like, if you're really oh, God, God, let me get out of the boat too, right? <laughs> that is true. I've never heard somebody say Peter before. That's an awesome answer. And then your explanation, that was... That helped shift my perspective. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. That's pretty cool. What is your favorite ice cream? I don't like ice cream. No? I know I'm that weird person. I don't <laughs> like ice cream. I don't mind frozen yogurt. Okay. Like I'll go to Dairy Queen, but I'm really boring. I just get a twist and a cone. <laughs> yeah. 
You know what? I think you are the second person I've ever interviewed that didn't like ice cream. I don't, I'm not a big fan of like cream and sugar. <laughs> okay. Well, what's the go-to dessert? Then? I like carbs. Carbs? Carbs. Carbs. Pastries. Give me some pastries. Give me some French fries. Carbs. Give me carbs. Sarah's, Sarah's doing a big thumbs up in the background. You can't see her, but that's Sarah's go-to. She Give her that cinnamon roll or, you know, just a good loaf of sourdough. Right? I don't know if you guys have a Publix, but Publix really does have really good sourdough. We don't. Oh, well. I've worked back east, so I've had, been to a Publix, but we don't have one out here that I know of. Oh, they've got good sourdough, and it's consistent. I love sourdough. Mm. So, Liz, before we go into our break for the second half of the show, what is warrior psychology? What is, I'm sorry, what? What is a warrior psychology? What is this yes. concept? Yes. For me, a warrior psychology is having tremendous mental, tough-minded strength, resilience, and a healthy self-confidence that keeps you moving forward and giving love unconditionally, even when people don't deserve it, and maintaining an optimistic viewpoint. It's like you like you practice and know these things or something. <laughs> I spent a lot of time studying them. And ironically, my boyfriend is, he was a sergeant major in Delta Force, and he survived three helicopter crashes, um, broke his back in one. And like, it's funny to read the literature on champion and warrior psychology, and then knowing a true war hero. Mm -hmm. And like, it's like you're the, it's like you walked out of a freaking textbook on this stuff. So it, it's crazy <laughs> to like study it. And then I've had the privilege of working with some professional athletes and knowing my boyfriend, obviously, just to like see how like it's not just like sometimes you read psychology and it's like, great, that's the perfect scenario, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody's really like this. It's just exactly. A theory. But to meet people like this to me just gives me so much hope because it's like if one person can do it, then you can do it too. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy, but it takes a certain mindset and within that mindset is a certain focus. It's one of the things I tell men in The Fallible Man is, you know, there are those 1% people, right? People look at people like David Goggins mm -hmm. and like Jocko Willink and some of the guys who have kind of put a presence on YouTube where you can see him and stuff. Guys who are exceptional elite special forces guys and stuff most men will never be them physically yeah. necessarily that perfect yeah. combination of genetics discipline mental space like their head space right mm -hmm. all of those elements coming together there is such thing as that one percent athlete yeah. or that one percent professional but you can imitate a lot of what they do yeah you can learn from a lot of that but you can imitate it to the best you want. You're probably not going to be David Goggins, right? right. And that's okay because you're not fully exactly. wired by them. And one thing that's important to just like highlight too is like people who are really good at war, they struggle on the opposite side too because at home there's no war. Yeah. And so sometimes people fantasize about things that they want to have when it really would change everything about them if they had that. Yeah, they, they don't know what that changes in you so right or some of the pain points exactly guys we've been getting to know liz so far and in the second half of the show we're going to dive into creating a championship mindset or a champion mindset we're going to bring in this warrior psychology with it right now we're going to roll our sponsors and we will be back with more from elizabeth how well do you sleep at night do you toss and turn and wake up more tired than when you went to bed sleep is commonly one of the critical elements people fall short on in their life the quality of sleep you get directly affects your ability to control your weight, your ability to add muscle, your stress levels, and your everyday job and life performance. If you're ready to move to the next level, then sleep has to be part of the plan. Check out our friends at ghostbed.com if you're ready to get your best sleep. I love my ghost bed. I've been sleeping on one for a couple of years and has made a huge difference in how I sleep. Hit ghostbed.com and use the code thefallibleman 30 to get 30% off your order and start getting better night's sleep tomorrow. Now, let's go on to the show. All right, guys, we're back and we're here with Elizabeth Lewis discussing creating the championship mindset. In the first half of the show, we were getting to spend some time with Liz and getting to know who she is and just having a great conversation. In this half of the show, we're really going to dig into creating that champion mindset and how you can do that in your life. Now, Liz, what purchase of $100 or less did you make in the last year that's had the most impact on your life? 
You just expect me to know that at the top of my mind? <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm not good under pressure right now. But I don't, I, hundred dollars, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I can tell you, I don't know if anything has necessarily changed my life of one thing. I mean, I read and study and I learn so much that I think the one thing that I've learned that's changed my life is a, the more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. And B, it really is as simple as just making up your mind and doing it. You know, there's no wrong answer to this question. I had one guy tell me the most impactful thing he had bought for under 100 bucks in the last year was a pair of gym shorts. The most impactful? Wow. Yeah. And he bought, loved it so much, he bought like eight more pairs at $70 a pair. So well, look. I mean, I get that. Like, I'm a woman, and us women, we have a hard time finding clothes. So when you find something you like, you buy it all. <laughs> so, gosh, I, you know what? $100 or less, I don't know. I was going to say I bought a 49-inch monitor. That really changed my life, but it was not under $100. Oh, I've been drooling over those. Is it the curved one? Yes. Oh, I've been drooling over those. Oh my God. Prime I, day, man. Dude, I, I was looking oh. at, like, may, not two days ago, I was looking at one on Amazon. <laughs> oh my gosh, on Prime day, I say, sold... I, saved like $500. Yeah. That's the key. Prime, that, day. prime day would be the time. Mm -hmm. What's the most impactful thing you've bought that's under $100? Under $100. Hmm. You know, I honestly always have to go back to books. Yeah. I, and I have a lot of people say that I would have to go back to books because Same. reading so many books over the course of the year, I mean, I really digest my books and it changes. And I, if you don't respond in the way you're living and the way you're doing things to a book you read, the book really wasn't that great. Agreed. Agreed. That's why my response was those two things. The more I learned, the more I realized I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. But my issue is I read so much that I can't always tell you like the book that I'm reading because I don't pay attention to the title or the author. It might sound horrible. Yeah. I'm reading four right now. Five. Yeah. That's my biggest problem. Me too. And I'm like, why can't I just read one book and finish it? But I get so excited that I'm like, oh, I'm going to read more. But also when we were in grade school and even college, you read 12 books at once. What the hell is the difference? Right. Well, I've got the ones I'm reading for the podcast, right? Because I, I have a hard rule about I won't discuss an author's book without reading it first. So I'm reading books for the podcast and I'm reading books for my business. Then I'm just reading. And so it's like, which one am I doing? I love audiobooks. They save my head on so many things. Mm. That's just not my, my like way I process, which is weird because I like, I participate with masterclass and I have so many bloody therapy trainings and I do it fine. But like with a book, I struggle, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's the narrator and I just want to like football spike the narrator <laughs> but i recently started using like short form and blink list or whatever it is mm -hmm. where you just get the like spine of yeah. the book and that's not terrible because some books like they just repeat themselves you're like at the you know i guess two-thirds of the way through you're like yeah you could finish this and not finish it and yeah, get yeah. The i got this point five chapters ago still on it yeah a lot no. of business books do that i've looked at blink list several times just for business books particularly yeah but some books, then I start reading, it's like, oh, I love this. But I grew up a preacher's kid. My dad also used to run a lot of large-scale conferences and stuff. So I grew mm -hmm. up listening to speakers constantly, mm -hmm. like yeah. really good speakers. And so my brain is trained to take a lot from auditory listening, like yeah. lecture-style classes and stuff work for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, I'm a social learner, so I can learn in lots of different ways. But for me, I just, if it's a boring narrator, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. That has rained a couple books for me. I've had a couple where I started and it's like, I cannot listen to this for seven and a half hours. <laughs> mm -mm. Someone mm -hmm. will die. It won't be good. It's, you know. Cause it's not just the sound of their voice. It's the cadence and it's timing. There's so many things that play into it. There are, there are. And we could probably go on and on and on about that. Probably. <laughs> Oh, but we should actually probably talk about what the show's about, I guess. I suppose. 
Mm. This is the problem. I start talking to my guests. I have so much fun talking to my guests and I get distracted on the rabbit trails. Mm. That's so, not bad. Elizabeth, how would you define a championship mindset? A champion mindset is where you believe you can make the impossible possible, where you're tough minded, but more specifically, a tough minded optimist. You have a healthy self confidence. You use your focus in a correct way and you do not struggle with fear stopping you. So you might still have fear, but it doesn't stop. Okay. So how does warrior psychology break down into building that championship mindset? How do we start putting those together to achieve the goals we want? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, one thing that is key for the champion mindset is is having a winning attitude already. And that means you have to come with the expectation to win, but obviously we can't control if we're gonna win or lose. So that also means seeing winning as very expansive sometimes. When I interview like the true war heroes or you know professional athletes or those people where we're like, oh, your mindset is amazing. The one thing that I consistently hear is their relationship with failure. You know, if you do something and you don't get the results you want, but it allows you to move forward by 1%, that's not a failure. That's a success. And so my point in saying that is when you do something, you're always actually moving forward. You're not moving backwards, especially when you have that champion mindset, if that makes sense. Now I get that entirely. I know one of the things that I picked up being around those guys. So I used to be at a special forces base and all of them go in with the mindset of winning is the only option. Mm -hmm. I can't perceive anything else going into the situation. I have to Mm -hmm. be prepared for Mm -hmm. other outcomes and how to respond to those. So I'm ready for it, but failure isn't an option. Mm -hmm. I'm going to succeed at this. Mm -hmm. And if something happens, this is how I'm going to respond to it. And that's, that's, I'm so happy you said that. One thing we also have to remember is like special forces. I mean, it's practice, practice, practice. It's muscle memory by the time they're in play, if you will. Yeah. And so they're so confident in their abilities. They trust themselves. They know how to do it. Like that is part of the champion equation. And a lot of people don't like to practice. A lot of people don't like to do the preparation work, yet when you study a champion psychology, you study the professional athletes, the war heroes, they spend 98% of their time practicing. And a lot of us are just like, no, put me in the game. I'm just ready to go. And it's like, if you don't have the right mindset, you're going to crumble. What do you, have you, have you read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear? I've not read it, but I'm very familiar with it in the sense of I've heard a lot about it and I've yeah. reviewed the big picture notes. So what do you think of the concept of just I building habits? That... Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry about building habits, right? You talk about pra- them practicing all the time, about mm-hmm. building those little habits that build on each other. I mean, it's literally the compound effect to a degree, right? Like that's how it works. I encourage people to take a step backwards. There's a awesome proverb that comes from Lao Tzu that is pretty on point. Neuroscience has proven it. Other faith systems have proven it. But watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become your habit. Watch your habit, that becomes your character. Watch your character, that becomes your destiny. So it's better to really hone in on your thoughts and where your thoughts are going and what you're saying so you can build the healthy habits. I think that People need to remember that best-selling books, that's a business at the end of the day. (laughs) Yeah. Some of the best books out there are the worst books to read. I'm just going to say that big picture, not necessarily about Atomic, not the book that we're talking about. But at the end of the day, like, it takes on average 65 days to build a habit. That's what neuroscience has proven us. People say difference. I always encourage people to get really clear on your why and on the mindset it would have to be consistent and really figure out what your core issues are. 
one thing that separates me from a lot of coaches and therapists out there is I don't care about your symptoms. I care about your core roots and I want to pull your roots because if we can pull your roots, we can get radical transformation a lot quicker. And that's a lot easier to do than people. I think it's really easy to build a life where you just go through the motions. And so I kind of like slightly get frustrated with some of the books out there that talk about habits because it just seems like you're going through the motions and you're trying to be busy mm -hmm. versus creating a truly rewarding and satisfactory life. Okay. I, one of the things that I took away from Atomic Habits that I actually liked out of it was the focus on the habit, blow the habit, blow the habit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do appreciate that they did that. Because we get to that, right? It's the whole reason that New Year's resolutions tank Someone goes to the extremes like, I've never been in the gym in my life, but I'm going to work out five days a week starting January. If we uh, pause, fear is motivating them. Mm -hmm. and nothing else, right? And when avoidance motivates you, you always fail. Well, but they skipped over so many things going from zero to a thousand. Just, right? There's no habit to build on. So I appreciated that about it. But I bring it up because you were talking about practice, right? Yeah. That psychology of practicing and just learning to trust yourself yeah, and trust that you've put in the reps, that you've put in the time, that when yeah. you are tested, you're okay. And really what we're talking about is the growth mindset. One thing that special forces talks about war heroes, professional athletes is they trust their effort. They know what they're going to do. And so if you can learn how to perfect the process of implementing your effort, you can go really far in life. Because at the end of the day, the only thing you have control over is yourself and how you use your effort. Okay. So overall, a championship mindset is a fairly healthy mindset for men to try and obtain, right? Absolutely, because it's also a relationship with yourself. I mean, much of life comes down to having a healthy self-esteem, self-efficacy, self-worth, and self-confidence. If you don't have those self-disciplined traits, then it's going to be difficult to do anything. I mean, if you look at something, you're like, no, I can't do that, and that's your for automatic thought, oh, well, great. That's where you start. In a time when we have the toxic masculinity culture kicking, and we both agree that's not necessarily a healthy option, some people might be opposed to championship mindset, but we're saying this is a healthy option and something worth pursuing for men. You have to remember that psychology is a bunch of theories. There's such thing as toxic positivity, says a lot of people that are realists. Realism is another word for pessimism. At the end of the day, you can't agree with everyone. You can only agree with your truth and what you feel resonates with you. Everyone is going to have an opinion. Everyone is going to disagree to some degree. I think the toxic masculinity is missing some really strong contextual points, which is when you are so competitive that you're being an a-hole, yeah, we got an issue. When you are being so competitive that you struggle with jealousy and bitterness, yeah, we have an issue. But jealousy and bitterness and if only in other toxic thinking are an issue across the, bro across the board. It doesn't matter if you're male or female or a they. Okay. Liz, what's the most important takeaway from today's conversation you want hear people to hear? I mean, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're, you're right. Henry Ford na nailed it with the mindset. I mean, it is amazing what our brains can do. And really what I'm saying is our minds, the brain and the mind is different. It's just amazing. So everything you believe about yourself right now, you are manifesting. Faith and fear are equal in substance. Which one are you going to subscribe to? What's next for Elizabeth Lewis? Ooh, what's next? Doing some speaking events, working on my YouTube channel, and soon I will have a sec or a third course out. It's Liz's Optimism Bootcamp. So it teaches people how to shift from pessimistic thinking to optimistic thinking. All right. Now, Elizabeth, is the website the best place to find you? Yes, I spend most of my time on LinkedIn or on my website and here and there on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, also YouTube. All right. And guys, I'm going to have all of Liz's links down in the description as always. And in the show notes, we will make sure that you can connect with her. Liz, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today and share with us. Good luck on your podcasting journey. Liz also has the Liz Show podcast. That you guys will have to check out. She has taken a little bit of a hiatus, but she is getting back into the swing of it. 
and you guys can get more talk with Elizabeth over there as well. Guys, as always, be better tomorrow because of what you do today, and we'll see you on the next one. This has been the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for everything man, husband, and father. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a show. Head over to www.thefallibleman.com for more content and get your own Fallible Man gear.